Sawati Krab. Coming to you today from Thailand. I want to talk to you real quick about data and anecdotes. So if you've been in rational circles for a while, you know that data is king and anecdotes are supposed to be essentially irrelevant. Anecdotes aren't data and there's something to be kind of despised that those dumb lay people talk about anecdotes and they don't have real data. I think this is a mistake. I think anecdotes are one type of data. They are somewhat lesser quality uh, than regular scientific data, but in some circumstances they are higher quality and more reliable. Data is simply a reporting of something happened. <laughs> so when I took this pill, this happened. Uh, when I said this thing, this happened. When I put these two elements together, this happened. It's just it's just reporting experiences. Anecdotes are people reporting their experiences just in a non-quantified, non-scientific way. And I think in many cases it's dogmatic to dismiss anecdotes and uh, wholeheartedly embrace, embrace scientific data just because it appears more uh, um, scientific. Let me give you a couple of examples. First let's talk about a hypothetical drug. Let's say there's a drug out there, let's say it's an antibiotic drug, and it's been approved by the mainstream uh, you know, FDA organizations and has a very low rate of side effects. Some of the side effects are fairly severe, um, but it's approved for mainstream use. But after the drug's approval, something happens. You start to get a lot of anecdotal stories. People start saying, hey, I took this drug and something really powerful happened to me. My, my tendons started to degrade and I, I, you know, I popped a tendon. I've had healthy ligaments my whole life, but my knee tendon popped, my ankle tendon popped. They said, I took this, this antibiotic for a sinus infection and now I can barely get out of my chair because my joints hurt so bad. And these anecdotes, they aren't data, they're just anecdotes, keep piling up, keep piling up. And then communities emerge around these anecdotes saying, oh, that happened to you too? Yes, that happened to me too. From somebody trying to evaluate what's going on from a scientific rational standpoint, what do you do? Do you look at the scientific data that says, well, in the randomized controlled study, there was only 3% of people had severe side effects, or 1% of people, or a fraction of a percent, whatever. And yet, in the real world, when people are taking this drug, lots of them are reporting very severe side effects. So are they just making it up? Is it placebo? Do they not, do, do, do the anecdotes not trump the data? Well, this isn't just a hypothetical. I urge everybody to Google the drug Levaquin, L-E-V-A-Q-U-I-N. This is a antibiotic drug in the quinolone variety. I'll give you a few anecdotes. In my life, I have met four people ever who have taken Levaquin, and I'll tell you how I know about this drug in a second. I've met four from four different bloodlines, each of which who have had significant joint pain as a function of them right after taking the drug. Maybe it's not connected, but maybe it is. My wife, my father, my sister-in-law, and a completely unrelated doctor in Atlanta. Four different bloodlines, only four people I have ever met who have taken Levaquin, and each one of them had significant joint pain. My wife only took, I think, one or two pills, and she was she almost had to be, uh, I almost had to wheel her around because she was in so much pain. My father was the same circumstance. He took pills for sinus infection and was practically crippled for some period of time. I don't know as much about um, the, what happened to my sister-in-law, but I know she had joint pain. And my doctor from Atlanta had literally had to get foot surgery because, well, be, and it just so happened that just prior to him having it, getting foot surgery because the tendon snapped, he had taken Levaquin for an infection. Isn't that interesting? Now, according to the data, the scientific data, it's a very, very low percentage of people report these side effects, and yet, if you Google Levaquin joint pain, you will find an insane amount of anecdotal stories from people online telling exactly what happened after they took the drug, with re really tragic circumstances, everything varying from their joints um, being ruined to losing their eyesight and all kinds of crazy shit. 
I don't think this is coincidental. I think it is dogmatic. It is, uh, it is like religious dogma to say, all of these people are just making it up because they didn't make it into the randomized controlled study. I think a far more plausible explanation is the actual official data that came out was wrong. It's far more dangerous drug than it should be. And go figure, just in the past few years, now the FDA in the United States is issuing a black box label or, or whatever saying, oh, by the way, um, some of the side effects of these could be very severe. And hopefully this drug will be taken off the market at some point because just from the research that I've done, it looks that it's causing more harm than good. Don't take my word for it. The point is to say, if it turns out that Leviquin causes uh, catastrophic joint problems, then it is the case then that somebody would be more justified in believing stories like I've just told you about the four people I've met in my own personal life that have, have had uh, joint problems after taking Leviquin, then dogmatically believing the official scientific study that came out, which was wrong. So that is not to say, of course, that all anecdote versus data situations are like this, but I do think it illustrates something which I believe to be far, 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 far more common than most rational people think, which is that the data is probably wrong, either because it's done incompetently or because it's done, it, it's biased that the drug companies that are financing this research and they have an incentive to bury um, the results that they find. Or like I said, it's from sheer incompetence. Or, or a small, relatively small data set. Unfortunately, I think you can take this example and apply it to all sorts of circumstances, especially in the field of um, nutrition and the effects, side effects of drugs. One of the things I'll talk a lot more about in the future is there's an epistemological problem here. There's a methodological epistemological problem where the data that comes from the real world, the actual ingestion of antibiotics by people who are being prescribed them from their doctors, doesn't go upwards. That, that, that information about, oh, by the way, this causes joint pain, doesn't go back to the doctors, doesn't go back to the drug companies, doesn't go back to the people producing the studies most of the time. Most of the time, if you have any interaction with the medical establishment whatsoever, if you say to your, your doctor, oh, you know, I took this drug, I had this reaction, they're not going to record it. They're going to say, oh, yeah, okay, well, sometimes that happens. You know, or they're going to say, oh, it's totally unrelated, and you're, you know, you're just making it up, don't worry about it. There's not this reverse flow of information from the real world to the people who are publishing the studies. It happens all the time. Before we talk about the next circumstance of anecdotes, I do want to mention just how poor the actual theories from the, from the professional intellectuals uh, in when we're talking about nutrition or, or um, human health. In terms of the crappy theories that we've had for the last several decades about the lipid hypothesis, about eating saturated fat makes you fat and clogs your arteries. And so there, uh, the elite intellectual recommendation is to eat a bunch of carbs, eat a bunch of processed grains. Well, it turns out, most likely, this is a completely bunk theory and the opposite is the case. Eating saturated fat is probably good for you, doesn't make you fat while eating a bunch of carbohydrates, does make you fat and causes heart disease. So they literally got the truth 180 degrees and this was the expert opinion being recommended by doctors and so on for decades. I suggest a great deal of skepticism when these people come out with their, their official data, especially if there's fundamental flaws in their theory or how they gather the data. I think to have faith in the scientific establishment uh, is not much more respectable than having faith a bunch of religious leader, leaders telling you what foods you should or should not eat. Now, to avoid the inevitable criticism about my skepticism towards uh, science in practice and the data gathering in practice. Let me give you a, another case of anecdotes which I think illustrate the problem with how most people conceive of anecdotal evidence. And that's ghosts. I've met lots of people in my life who will argue that they have seen ghosts, they believe in ghosts, they think they've seen ghosts in a graveyard. And I'm very, very skeptical of this notion, even though there's tons of anecdotal evidence. Well, 
we have to be very careful with anecdotal evidence and we have to do uh, the following thing. When somebody reports data that they've received, either I took this pill and this happened or I was in the graveyard and I saw this, we don't have to throw out the data just because it's anecdotal. What we need to do is challenge the theoretical interpretation of the data. So I'm not going to sit here and say nobody who's been in a graveyard and have seen things, they haven't seen anything, they're just making it up or they're just hallucinating. No, I don't think that's the correct way to approach any kind of data. You say this, I have a positive belief based on anecdotal evidence that when people are in graveyards late in the evening that they see things that they think they can best explain by positing the existence of ghosts. Now, they might even agree that with that. Uh, and I think most people would agree with what I've just said. I've not dismissed the data. I've not dismissed the, um, the facts as they've reported them. What I've said is there's a difference between somebody saying, oh, I saw this light in a graveyard moving in a funny way, and oh, I saw a ghost in a graveyard. So if I have a theoretical explanation for what people see in the graveyard at 2 o'clock in the morning that doesn't include ghosts and yet still gives you explanatory power, maybe that theoretical interpretation of the data is superior. Let me give you my attempt at explaining what people see in graveyards in the evening. I, for one, have been in graveyards late at night, 2 in the morning, and I report seeing lots of lights and shapes and movements that I never see in my everyday life. Now, if I had a belief system which was casual about what types of things I think existed and I thought ghosts ex existed, I'd say, yeah, I've probably seen some ghosts out the corner of my eye in a graveyard. But I think that's actually a really, that complicates our theories greatly if we posit the existence of ghosts because then we have to say, well, there are such things as these souls that are not physical and yet we can see them and they, are, they only inhabit the graveyards at night and nobody can ever take a picture of them that isn't blurry, but that's just because of their nature. You have all kinds of really difficult explaining to do if you were to say <laughs> that you think ghosts exist. But I can attest to the fact that spooky and confusing things happen at two o'clock in the morning in graveyards. But here's my explanation why. In graveyards, there are objects which you really don't encounter anywhere else. That's gravestones, lots and lots of different sizes of gravestones. Some are you know, uh, rectangular, some kind of have the domed top, some are really tall pillars, some are um, uh, like mausoleums, little, little mini buildings with dead bodies there and grates on them. There's all kinds of weird shapes in the graveyard that you don't encounter anywhere else and they're all packed together in this way that you wouldn't encounter anywhere else. In addition to the funky shapes that are in graveyards, you also have the natural result of being in this place with a bunch of funky shapes. That's light does really weird things. If a car goes by and you've got this field of weird shaped objects, you get a, a bunch of really weird patterns of light all around you. The little bits of light bounce off this and they just barely make it through that and you have this kind of, you know, dome shaped thing that's being projected over there and it kind of looks like it's walking and movement and then it goes away really quickly, and it, right? It's just because you're in that circumstance where it, you're in a weird circumstance at night so you can't really see very well. So you can't make out what the motion is coming from. The light off in the distance and then, and then maybe you have animals there that you can't see because it's dark. So you have you know, sounds that you're unfamiliar with and motion that you're unfamiliar with and light that you're unfamiliar with and it's all kind of moving quickly and you can't really pin it down. Now that explanation explains the data. The data being I saw a bunch of things I can't easily explain and I don't know what they are in graveyards at 2 o'clock in the morning. And it doesn't posit the existence of objects that are ghosts, which are really hard to explain in any kind of rational sense how ghosts work. And this is the point. Whenever you're encountering data, anecdotal data, scientific data, you don't have to believe the communicator's theoretical attempt at explaining the data. You can accept the existence of the raw data without accepting the theoretical explanation. The same thing is true of Big, Bigfoot. Do I think Bigfoot exists? No. Do I think lots of people have seen lots of really 
big moving furry things in the forest that they can't they don't exactly know what they are yeah of course this is also true with religious experiences do i think that people have all kinds of remarkable experiences in their sleep communicating with what they think are beings from another dimension yeah i think that happens do i think that in reality there are these interdimensional beings that are communicating with earthlings I'm a little bit more skeptical of that. I don't want to take away from the data, the experience. It's just I'm skeptical of people's theoretical interpretation of that data. Now, this video would not be complete if I didn't, of course, bring it back to mathematics. <laughs> a similar phenomenon is happening in mathematics, especially with calculus. People try to argue that the, theor the theory of calculus, let's say, must be correct because in practice, calculus works. We have lots and lots and lots of data of the calculations in calculus giving us practical solutions to problems that work in the real world. Then people turn around and say, ah, therefore the theory must be correct. This is no different than somebody seeing apparitions in a graveyard, seeing lights in a gra graveyard and saying, and the reason they're there is because there are ghosts. And that fully explains all of these experiences. No. In mathematics, if you guys are unfamiliar with my position, by the way, I claim that there are subtle yet fundamental errors in the theory of modern mathematics and has to do with this idea of a completed infinity, which I don't think exists. You can see some of my other videos on the topic if you're interested. But I would say I have an explanation for the data of why calculus works, and it's not because the orthodox theoretical interpretation is correct. The reason calculus works is because reality is finite. The reason calculus solves Zeno's paradoxes is because there's a fundamental base unit of space. Reality is not infinitely divisible. So this relationship between theory and data and, and accepting the data, the raw data, but not necessarily accepting the theory, is not just applicable to areas when we're talking about antibiotics or ghosts or, or any of those things. It's also applicable to what people think is a purely deductive field of thought, which is mathematics. It applies to anywhere where there is data to be gathered, which is pretty much everywhere. My suspicion is that 50 years from now, we're going to have a much different perspective uh, about the value of anecdotes, anecdotal evidence, and some of the dogmatism that has plagued the past 150 years in regards to what people think of as scientific data and what I think is really a false dichotomy between the two. The difference between anecdotal data and scientific data is really one on a spectrum and I think it's dogmatic to either dismiss or accept one type of data over the other just because it fits that particular taxonomic distinction. Plus we use anecdotal data all the time in our everyday life for constructing our beliefs about the world. There's some product or service I'm thinking about using, and I know somebody personally who I respect their opinion. They've used that particular product, good or service, or if I'm trying to get information about a person, their opinion, their experience, though it's not formally quantified in any kind of white paper, I listen to them. I think it's important. I think you can learn probably more about other people telling you about their experience than you can about reading some formalized white paper by people you have no idea who produced it. I at least know if the people around me are trustworthy and competent. I don't know if the people in the scientific establishment or the people in the, the business, I don't know if they're competent. I have lots and lots and lots of data of the established experts being fundamentally wrong and mistaken and not worthy of trust. So for those few people in my life that I do actually trust, I put a lot more weight in their anecdotal evidence than I, than I would um, in the official orthodox evidence.